okay? These are some of the top performers in the industry, yet they are also some of the most humble people I've ever met. So I'm really, really, really honored to bring them to you today. As a group, these three people, are you ready for a large number? Take a guess, how many, how many units do you think these three teams represent up here? Just take a guess, from last year, 2019, how many units? Right? So what I encourage you to do is you do your 
to share their answers to the questions, ask yourself which one most resonates with me and my team culture, and that would be the one for you, okay? So Amy, how would you say it's time to know I need some help with LinkedIn, it's time to hire somebody? Sure, yeah, I agree with you. Really, that, that is our goal, is especially with inbound leads, they're your um, best company is speed to lead, and it's making sure that you have the capacity to handle those at a really high level, and to continue to do the follow-up. There's fortune in that follow-up. The other thing that we do, we are very blessed to have Lance, who is a visionary of our company. He is also data-driven, and so he has spreadsheets out to 2036. He is very um, forward-thinking in the business that we want, and so we have we work backwards from that five-year plan to three-year plan to one-year plan in what will the business be six months from now to support the business that we're growing into. And so we're looking to make that hire for all of our team six months before we know that we need them. And it really helps us hire the right people. And what would you say is sometimes people say, you know, should I hire one ISA at a time, two ISAs? Like, how do I make sure I actually have one good one that actually works out? So what would be, I think this is open to any of you, what would you say is your best practice for hiring and making sure that they're a good fit for the team and they actually work out and stick? Yeah, so on the running team, we usually want to hire at least between three to five ISAs. We don't want to repeat that onboarding process multiple times in a short period of time. Um, and with the expectation that we were to hire five ISAs, we expect at least three of them to make it. Um, and it's, I mean, time consuming. We take time out, we've got to train them, and um, make sure that we know the systems and that takes about at least a week or two uh, before they even get on the phones. Um, and I myself, so I do the training for the ISAs, uh, but I'm also still in production. Uh, so I want to make sure that. Spending two weeks training into my days getting them up and running. Um, and this is where as a coach, I internally struggle because all of you have a different business, right? So, what I would say too is if you have a coach, talk to your house coach about what is the right time for me. Um, sometimes I hear single agents. How many of you here are single agents? Raise your hands. Awesome. I love that you're here. So, Sometimes we're looking for the, the ISA to help take some of that stuff off of our plate, right? Um, and actually, your first hire is an admin, according to the model, because if they take things, a lot of admin off your plate, you can handle the lead gen more because you're not doing all the admin stuff. Um, so I think it's all just going to depend on your team. And so take some of this and then, again, look at your finances, um, you know, is an admin going to solve it for you if you had more operations help and then you could be more in the business? Here's a good benchmark. And tell me, I love your opinions too. I found on our team, two to three agents per one ISA seems to be a pretty good ratio. Uh, what about for you guys? I, this is not a pre question because you have to think about it. What's usually the ratio of one ISA for how many agents? And then as you answer that, tell us, is your ISA doing all the lead gen? Or agents also lead gen. Yeah, that's, I'm glad you added that caveat because it makes a big difference. Yeah, in that average. So for our team, it's more like one to two, and that's because our ISAs represent 98 percent of our business. So our agents, our ISAs are representing 98 uh, percent of all the inbound and outbound lead generation that happens for our team as a whole. So it, it really depends on what the model is, and if your outside agents are still lead generating. And then who do your outside agents? And what we mean by that is your higher listing agents. Who are they generating for that 2%? Or where, do the, where does that 2% come from? Sure. That 2% is going to be from their personal sphere of influence. That circle of influence that they still have a direct connection with. Could be their friends, could be their family. Um, we certainly do some of their sphere cultivating for them. So we reach out on their behalf for any agents that don't want to cultivate a sphere. That's uh, an option we give to our team. But yeah, definitely it would be our sphere of influence. So for her, I say is doing all lead gen basically, one I say for two agents. Okay, what about Claire Mark and Pam? No, we're about the, the same. We um, are still growing, and so we have newer agents and newer ISAs, and so it can go, but um, that's a pretty good standard for us as well. Perfect. And Mark? Oh, we're about one ISA to every seven or eight outside sales agents. Um, we do all inbound prospecting, so we don't do any cold calling. Um, all of our leads are coming out to us through our marketing uh, venues. Um, and so our ISAs are just kind of plugging away all day and looking at what's So, yeah, they're all successful, right? And all do people different. So, 
the defining what works for you. Okay, so what doesn't work? I have something I'm very passionate about, but I'm gonna share. Uh, but what doesn't work when onboarding an ISA? So basically, how do you set up an ISA to fail? Because we have a lot of people that said our ISAs are not succeeding when they're leading this team. So let's just be real. What has not worked so we can help them avoid it? Whoever wants to go first, go for it. I would say that the biggest thing is not setting clear expectations. Um, so obviously, we, we take time, we're going to make sure that they're trained up and they're going to do a great job and they have all the tools necessary to do that. Um, but if I'm not setting clear expectations in terms of how many appointments they need to book each week, uh, what their show rate needs to be, um, then they, they're not going to know if they're doing a good job or not. Um, and we get together uh, once a week, once we onboard them uh, for the first 90 days, uh, one on one with new ISAs, just to make sure that they are hitting their numbers, they're not hitting their numbers. We're trying to figure out why we take turns. Uh, we listen to the phone calls, uh, figure out what they can do about differently in terms of scripting, how to establish time and motivation. Um,
problem set. So you know what that did is there's a, a chemical in your brain when you have success called dopamine. So even though it was handed to me, and you could even say he was losing some money on that because now he's paying me for studying it, that was actually a huge return on investment. Because you know what that did? It made me feel awesome. And so it was easier for me now to go and get back on the phone with some of those more challenging sources. So can I share, and I'm not a panelist, I'm really trying to rein in my passion because I love to talk about this stuff, but can I share a, a horrible fail on every time? Thank you. 
for how quickly an ISA will get us to speed. So how much time do we allow them to not be hitting the, the benchmark we eventually want them at? And then what is that benchmark? So to stay on the team, we need this from you from a production standpoint. Yeah, so um, on the Reynolds team, we first, our first week we onboard the, the ISAs, it's an in depth training, it's a way from our office to go to the we are from office to a Kenya lead office, and uh, we sit down, we go through the culture, our team values, and then we go through scripting, expectations, and whatever everybody's supposed to hit. Um, after that first week is when we get their 30, 60, 90 commit, uh, commences, um, and then their first 30 days they're expected to be booking uh, at least two appointments a day. Um, in the first 30 days. In the first two appointments. Oh, no, no, no. And then after that, it's five appointments per day, and then after the 90 days, it's uh, 10 appointments per day. Um, and they're expected to make it. Is that per day or per week? Oh, per week, per week. Oh, my God. 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 Oh, my Two a week, then five a week, and then ten a week. Uh, still expected of, yes, and then still expected to maintain that 65% um, sure. 65% sure, which is great, by the way, right? Our target in coaching state is 70 to 80% sure ratio. Um, and so, especially for new say that's really great. That takes time to build. So. If we got to 65 by working backwards, so we looked at the numbers that we produced last year, uh, hit our goal of uh, 750, and figured out how many leads that we need to generate. Uh, what our short rate was last year, so we got how many we can generate this year, kind of worked our way backwards, um, and we're hitting our numbers in terms of appointments, which is at least 124 votes each week, and maintaining that 65% short rate, and we'll get to 1100 votes this year. How many of you have your minds blown right now? That's a lot to, it's from tracking, right? And just so you know, in a minute, we're going to put on the slide exactly when you should be tracking and what percentages you should be targeting. I, I shouldn't really work, should it? Yeah, what are some good benchmarks? You guys can take a picture of that in just a second. Okay, so Claire, I know you're very really passionate about tracking. By the way, I coach with Claire, and she, I, I could probably call her in the middle of the night and say, Claire, what's your number on this? And she could just sleep away and stop the share it. She's awesome with tracking. So Claire, tell us why you're passionate about tracking, and then what are your expectations from your ISA teams? Yeah, I, um, I never would have thought I was a numbers person. Um, and when I joined the team, I was very leery about sales position because I felt like it was very um, like, well, like you couldn't control it. And, and working with Anna, she really pushed me uh, my first year to set goals and she helped me determine how many calls, um, appointments and all of that I needed um, to hit that goal and what that broke down to a day. She's like, if you just do this, you will hit your goal. And um, I did. And I've done it every year um, since just following um, the tracking system. So numbers are super important. They um, can show you a path to whatever it is um, you you want to make. So um, if you're not tracking, um, and she'll show you the metrics in a minute, I track exactly what she's going to show. Um, start. I mean, you start tracking something, and then it will it will help determine um, what you need to do to get to where you want to be. It's huge. How many of you would say I'm actually really good at tracking? I feel really good about this right now. Okay, that's what I thought. So let me share where you start. If you're feeling a little overwhelmed, then email from the studio, then you can add to that. Um, really, a great place to start is how many contacts. You can just look at the past month, past year, go back however far you think seems reasonable, um, and ask yourself how many contacts did I have, and then how many closings did that produce? You at least have a general idea. They should want to average 75 contacts will earn you one closing. So you can look and see, am I at 75 contacts to earn me a closing? Is it 125? I could be assigned to work on some skill or maybe change, change up some things. Uh, 75 contacts on an average will earn a closing. Really, here, the main things you want to look at, too, are how many listing appointments am I keeping and how many are actually hiring the team. And I got that actually from Sarah Reynolds on a panel yesterday. Because listing is driving the business. So that's another thing is how many listing appointments are showing and how many are signing. Because if that's humming well, a lot of things will flow from that, right? Okay, Amy, what, if anything, do you have to add to tracking and expectations? So I, I also am not a huge numbers person. Just by nature, it's not my strength zone. So I, I think it's just important to reiterate that I love what numbers give me. Numbers give me the power to know how to change the business and change the results. So when I have someone on my team that 
that we know what their goal is and what they want to make, the numbers tell the story that help you get them there. So it's always a, in, in my opinion, it's an activities game. It's a, so it's either, it's either of your activities and or of your skill. You might have to do both, but it's always contacts and skill. And so the more you can kind of move those levels, the more you can achieve what you want in your business. That was my main point. I so expectations, so what do you expect from your United States? Yeah, so when we bring someone on at the beginning, we do have a 30, 60, 90 plan. Our 30, 60, 90 plan at the beginning is much more focused around contacts and activities. It's building their time block, it's building their number of contacts they're able to get a day, and ensuring that they're on the right follow-up campaign, and that they're consistently understanding how to do that. Then it changes into appointments and into conversions. Uh, on our team, our conversions to the team are 80% set to kept and 60% set to signed. Which 80% set to kept, great job. I think mean, your team really shines in that area. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. So you're telling me you're tracking. Um, how many of you have been, <laughs> I promise I'll tie this together again. How many of you have been to the Grand Tetons in Wyoming? Okay, isn't that beautiful? Okay. So I want you guys to just stick with me. <laughs> Shocked that 
there's going to be something to sign, right? It's really the agent's role to get the signature, right? I say we're not going to get the signature. Yet if we set it up properly, the agent should have a really good chance of getting the signature. So I would say that's both, and it's important to communicate. And Claire, I'm going to come to you in a minute about what that communication loop looks like. Um, and then the, the sign that closed is 100% the agent. Yet if you're setting goals, as an ISA, you can't produce your income unless you're tracking how many closings do you earn. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay, so kind of tell us a little bit about the communication loop. Because another way to fail as an ISA with an ISA team is to not give them feedback. Because think about it, we're hiring results oriented people, right? So all of you that are results oriented, think for a minute, if you didn't get feedback on the thing that you teed up and you're results oriented, how long would you stay in that role if you did not get feedback? Right? So you gotta have feedback. So we're going to talk to us about what the feedback loop looks like, and then Mark and Claire, starting with Claire, tell us. And Mark and Amy, I'll come to you. So what does the feedback loop look like? Yeah, so the feedback is really important. In LRT, we, we really empower the ISA to own the lead, um, all the way to sign and even to close. You know, those are your people. Um, you can check in on them as, as much as you need to. You can check in on the agent. Um, but in general, um, our process is when the equipment is set, um, the agent is supposed to call within 24 hours, and they have a set of additional um, pre-qualification questions to ask that follow up with the ISA did. Um, and they actually submit those answers back to the ISA, um, and then they also are supposed to report back 24 hours, within 24 hours after the agreement was held, um, to report how it was. Um, and the next steps, um, our ISA does not hand the lead to the agent until um, there is um, communication and they feel confident in giving it fully um, to the agent. And again, they can still check that they need to. And, and a follow-up too is at what point does the ISA come? Because that was a question I heard before class of are they teeing up like nurtures? Are they handing over appointments? So how do you know it's time to pass it over to an agent? Um, we physically reassign it in our CRM when um, the agreement is signed or the agent says we're really, really close, go ahead and send them to me. Um, we reassign them, but again, the ISA keeps a follow up. But they took the ISA send it when they set the appointment? No, they, the ISA sends it after the appointment when the agent has agreed to take it. Like there's a mutual agreement. I think I'm not asking the right question, right? This is totally me. And it's probably because guys, Susan Upley, having fun, <laughs> me too, right? When I came in, when I sent names to an agent, like, hey, here's a pretty qualified appointment that's actually ready to sit down and talk about hiring you, or do I pass it over when it's like, hey, this guy's interested, see if he's, you know, just talk. That's what I mean. Is that more clear? <laughs> Sorry about that, Claire. Yeah, no, all of ours are consultations, either at the house or in the office. Um, if it's a buyer moving in, we will do a phone or video. Um, but they would still need to get in the office when they come um, in the area. So they're all pre-qualified. They go through, like I said, a question. Pre-qualification -qual pre -pre from the ISA, and all of that's handed off to the agent um, to help set them up for success. Who else? Either one of you. Um, so the ultimate goal for the ISA our team is to set up our outside sales agency for success. Um, we do it a little bit differently where we don't um, have our outside sales agents call or come in, have any communication with the prospect uh, until they actually get face to face. Um, so we have a bunch of different pre-qualification questions um, that we'll ask uh, the prospect. For instance, if it's a buyer, um, if, are you pre-approved? If not, what's your credit score? Um, if you're renting, what are you currently paying for rent? Do you want to stay around that number for a month before you're pretty comfortable going a little bit higher? Um, and then based off of the responses that we're getting, and obviously if they're not looking to move within six months, then we'll get them taken out uh, for follow-up. Uh, but if we're getting you know, all the answers that we need, then we'll go ahead and we'll book that appointment. Um, there, there's no, I guess, mutual agreement for, for us. Uh, we follow the best lead, those the best OSA, outside sales agent. Um, yeah. Perfect, thank you. What I think is so cool is that this just reminds me that there's a million different ways to get there. Right. Everybody has their own system. I think it's more important that you find a system that works really well for your team, what works for your outside agents, what, what builds the most trust, and then you have a process, you stick to the process, and you have accountability on the process. 
Because truly, um, just like you said, we expect the partnership to be reciprocated and that when we set appointment with the nose, 20, within 24 hours after the appointment happens, we would expect a follow-up to us of how the appointment went and what happened. Uh, we also have some accountability measures in place there to make sure that happens on both sides, to make sure notes are in and to make sure that follow-up comes back to the agent. So I think that that's a really important piece. As far as specifically for our team, what we do is it works a little bit differently for the buy side and the list side for our team. Uh, we definitely do pre-qualify if they are ready, willing, and able to meet with someone to sign the work to move forward when they meet. We do sometimes meet buyers further out. We feel like I guess the buyer who wants to meet with us get face to face, we're always going to meet because we want to build that relationship and, and educate them, and we know we can maintain the cultivation until whenever they're ready. And buyers, you guys know, will be the ones to be like, yeah, I'm not waiting for, I'm going to be six months from now. And I'm like, come on yesterday. And I guess they get so excited, and then they just change their mind. So um, we want to get in front of that and make sure we build a relationship and a connection quickly. Um, we do the pre qualifying, we book it out on the outside agents' calendars. They give us time slots that they're available and committing to take appointments. So there's definitely the reciprocation needed for us. They've given us very clear uh, information as to when they can take them, and so our job is to fill those slots. And then our buy side does do a pre-call, and they all introduce themselves and just build some rapport with the buyer. And our list side does not. Uh, we send confirmation emails that include some information and their picture and a video and things like that. And, um, and then they're required to do the stack after it's done. Perfect. And Claire, you have something too. I know recently your team's done a fantastic job of increasing the show ratio, so from set to show, and it was really from one to the eight when you said reminded me of it. So Claire, why don't you share with everyone what helped the show ratio go up recently? Yeah, we recently implemented, um, we all, the agents have always called um, to introduce themselves. Um, but they, and this is primarily on the listing side, they would do it later in the process, so maybe the day before they met them. Um, and we moved that call up to them calling, if they can even, same day that the appointment was set. And um, they're having a really great relationship, like they're building this relationship with the person, and we're having a much better um, health rate. What was the rate, what was the increase? Well, for one of our ISAs, um, he said it was something like he said 39 appointments in January, and he had like 35 show up. It was almost a 90 percent show rate. Yeah, it was just a yeah, really good increase. Good follow up, so awesome. Anything else to add on that? The the handoff process? Anybody? If not, good. Okay. I will say one really great thing about circling back with the feedback, and this kind of happened by accident on our team, yeah, I started going to the agents, hey, did they show up, and then did they sign? And if they didn't sign, I started asking, well, why didn't they sign? And I started keeping a little tracker, which I'm so not a tracker person, and it's changed our world, and then I became a tracker person. Is I started getting able to find patterns. So if I was constantly seeing, yes, they showed, they did not sign, and maybe five appointments that we were, you know, don't want to pay your commission, don't want to pay your commission, don't want to pay your commission, don't want to pay your commission. Well, what are you going to do as a team? Right, you're going to work on that script specifically. So there's so much value in that feedback loop back to the, to the ISA as to what happened because that can tell us uh, this is it something we can work on, this is it something that agent needs to work on, and, and that is what I'm looking for. So if it comes back and it says not pre qualified, that's why they didn't sign. I actually turn them away because they weren't pre qualified. Is that ISA or agent? That's ISA. Because I should have made sure they were more pre qualified on our team, right? Again, there's different ways to do it. Um, if, if it's not able to pay commission, did I dig that out on the call to let the agent know, hey, they're a little concerned about paying commission, be ready for that? So there's a lot of value in finding out why they didn't sign. That, that becomes where you work on your skill. Got it? Okay, go ahead. One thing I'll add to that, just because I think it could be helpful to, to people in the room that are building out this team, is that that's a piece that became leverage for us. We have, we have a VA who manages all of our appointments. So as we set appointments as ISAs, we have a VA that goes in and updates a tracker for the team. So a lot of our data stuff, where, where there's power in numbers and us knowing exactly what it will take for us to achieve our goals, we have a virtual assistant who's helping us collect all that data. 
So we asked our outside agents for the call out reason, or basically what you said, what was the reason why they didn't sign? But it isn't necessarily the ISA's job to consistently be following up with our outside agents to figure out all of those things. We have a virtual assistant who provides a lot of that support that just takes some admin stuff off the ISAs to allow them to get back into the agent time. That's a really great point. So, and how many people are on your team? How many people are on your team? We have 14 full-time ISAs, one full-time success coach, so someone who's out of the lead generation coaching, and six in training. Yeah. And that's just the ISA department, right? Yeah. How many people are on your team total? 86. 86. So keep in mind, too, you got to know what works for your team, right? So some of you, it might be time to pull the trigger and go to the to do that. Some of you might go to your songs. <coughs> again, there's not right away, right? You just have to know where your team is. Cool. Okay, so let's get into some fun stuff. Um, so Gary Keller, to summarize this quote here, and actually I'll just read it. It dawned on me that very few people have the perfect sales profile and that no one is truly a natural lead generator. The gift of God should never be mistaken for natural sales skill. Kind of chuckle, right? Now pause there. How many of you are rainmakers and you say, I went to hire my ISA and I don't know, I just do it. I just do it, right? That's a sign that you probably are really just naturally good with people, but you can't train someone how to be naturally good with people, right? They have to have the system and the process. So that's what he's really saying here. It became obvious to me that everyone has to master the specific and meaning scripts, dialogues, and skills of the generation to be really successful. So let's jump into that. I would love to know. Choice. 
people will naturally choose one versus do you want to make me? Right? And they say no, and you're like, oh shit. Sorry. <laughs> Dispatch 
I was feeding him information the whole time we were driving to that house. So we pretty much knew by the time we got there what was on the other side of the door. Is that not such a great analogy for what we do as appointment setters? Right? I want to make sure that agent has the best opportunity for success on the other side of that door. So I'm going to set it up that way, and I'm going to make it my point to kind of poke and pull out any objections, not to solve them, but so that I can tell the agent you are not this and they've got. Got it? Perfect. Like, why didn't the other agents ask me this? 
you guys have probably experienced this, but they often will say things like, um, I don't know why, I just kind of like you, or you're the only one I've wanted to talk to, and they don't always know why, but it's because you're asking about them, you're using their words, you're asking about their goals, and it's kind of delightful, right? Like, they're just not used to that. Um, and so that's why it's so powerful. 